Well, that programme represents the latest scientific thinking on which it, what is only a scientific hypothesis. The prediction of a nuclear winter after a massive nuclear exchange stands as a hypothesis open to confirmation or refutation. Doubts about the thesis have been expressed most notably by Edward Teller, father of the H-bomb, but even he refuses to reject the possibility of nuclear winter. The Reagan administration has commissioned an urgent two-year study of it. Later this year, the prestigious National Academy of Science in Washington publishes the results of its own report on the subject. Newsnight understands from some of those who've seen a draft of the report that it will not challenge the overall picture presented by Professor Sagan and his colleagues in a serious way. Our purpose now, after both threads and on the eighth day, is to examine political and military ideas that those programs deliberately didn't set out to do, but which are urgently raised by them. And there are three main areas that we're going to discuss in the next hour. First, can a nuclear escalation be controlled so that it stops well short of mass destruction and the nuclear winter? Second, what lessons are to be drawn about Britain's civil defense program and its ability to provide either for the aftermath of a mass nuclear attack or the prospect of nuclear winter? And third, what effect does the nuclear winter hypothesis have on nuclear deterrence and our readiness to rely on nuclear weapons as a key element of defense? All these issues, of course, were given a new topicality by President Reagan earlier today when he talked about the need for more dialogue with the Soviet Union. Now, to discuss these issues, we have in the studio a panel of military and strategic experts from Britain and the United States, and spokesmen from the three main parties. They are for Labour, Robin Cook, MP, a close advisor to the Labour leader, Neil Kinnock, and one of the architects of the party's new defence policy. For the Conservatives, George Walden, MP, a Soviet specialist, and as a diplomat, he was private secretary to two former foreign secretaries, Lord Carrington and Dr David Owen. For the Alliance, the SDP defence spokesman, John Cartwright, MP. I should point out we did invite Michael Heseltine, the Defence Secretary, to take part in the discussion, but he declined to do so. Also, we asked for an official spokesman from the Home Office to discuss government civil defence plans. They too decided they didn't want to join in. Now, let's start first with the question of how a nuclear conflict might or might not escalate. Now, the film Threads took a certain view of escalation from a limited exchange into an all-out attack. Now, one of the central questions is whether a limited controllable nuclear war is possible, or whether escalation all the way leading to nuclear winter is far more likely. And to start the discussion on this issue, I have in the studio Paul Bracken, Professor of Political Science at Yale University, and in Washington, Edward Lufbach of the Georgetown Center for Strategic and International Studies. Paul Bracken, can I start with you? Why do you believe, or in what way do you believe, that nuclear war will escalate pretty rapidly? Let me start, John, by saying that it, I'd like to emphasize in the strongest possible terms that it is the policy of the United States to avoid the ca catastrophes that we saw last evening on television and that we saw described by the nuclear winter show. No one wants a nuclear war, least of all the United States, including a nuclear war in Europe, because it is inconceivable to me that if London, Paris, and Bonn are destroyed in some sort of a conflict with nuclear weapons, that the United States can't escape unscathed. I think that's just a ridiculous theory. Having said that, let me also point out that it is, in my experience, extremely hard to get a nuclear war started. I worked for 10 years at an organization called the Hudson Institute, where we did policy-level wargaming for the United States government. We played games and games of all variety, and it was terribly hard to get such a war started. Why? Because people are terrified. They are scared witless of these weapons. Frequently, the umpires would have to rig the games to simply get to something like a nuclear threshold. Having said all that, I think we do have to take account of the existence of nuclear weapons, of the very large stockpiles that are on each side. And we cannot underscore enough that even one use of nuclear weapons is incredibly dangerous. The question that you ask about escalation, I think, is often misunderstood. It is often believed that somehow the President of the United States or one of our political leaders would like to fight a limited nuclear war. There is no such attitude around. In fact, it represents a last-ditch, desperate alternative to what? To an all-out nuclear war, which would produce the sort of nuclear winter and catastrophe we saw last night. Can, can I just, just interpose there very briefly? Certainly. I think the question is, once one nuclear weapon has been thrown, Fine. does it follow that uh, escalation from that stage onwards is very fast, or does it need five or ten? Give us a rough scenario of what you think escalation involves. rough scenario is because of the terror involved on each side, I don't think escalation is automatic once a few nuclear weapons go off. The problem you have is that one side uses 
10, 10 nuclear weapons. The other side can respond with 10 nuclear weapons, and it can escalate in that fashion. I believe that a small number of nuclear weapons can be used uh, without automatic escalation. I think if you get to the hundreds of weapons, it is much less likely. And I think if you get into nuclear exchanges involving thousands of weapons, it is almost inconceivable to me that the conflict can be controlled. One import of this is to take what NATO has recently done, which is to de-emphasize nuclear weapons in its strategy, to build up its conventional forces. And I must say that although there's a lot of attention to the, to the cruise missiles and Pershing missiles, NATO has decided in the past three years to remove over 3,000 tactical nuclear weapons from its arsenal to emphasize conventional forces. Why? Because even if a few nuclear weapons can be used, it's too risky to have a strategy based on that. And we, there we, are alternatives. We, we will get onto that. But once you say once a few hundreds have been exchanged, what are the precise factors which will make it very likely that commanders will lose control and, and politicians will lose control of the nuclear exchange? The most likely factor is that it is not the weapons that we hear about which are the most vulnerable parts of an arsenal. It is the command and control system. And one can imagine politicians flying around in airplanes or being in underground bunkers. The problem is you have to have communications between the command authorities and the weapons themselves. So there's a tremendous incentive to issue orders to take certain actions in the event of a certain number of weapons going off, because that may be the last orders that any military commander receives. In addition, if we look at Soviet military doctrine, it places primary stress on attack of the Western command and control system. So I, there's not a scrap of evidence to show that the Soviets buy any notion of limited nuclear war, something I consider most unfortunate, but I think we have to look reality in the face here. Can I hold it there, Paul Bracken, and bring in Edward Lutwak from uh, Washington. At what stage, if any, do you think that uh, this process of using nuclear weapons, Dr. Lutwak, can be, can be controlled, or, and how far do you feel that once it has reached a certain stage, several hundreds of weapons, said uh, Paul Bracken, it becomes uncontrollable? I, I think it is... Um a wild exaggeration to think even in terms of dozens of nuclear weapons, let alone hundreds. The context, of course, is that there is a very large and powerful Soviet army. We have always steadfastly refused to match the Soviet army with an equally large and powerful Western army. And therefore, we have always relied on the threat that if the Soviet army were to advance, we would use nuclear weapons. Now, how many nuclear weapons? Where? In what circumstances? That has varied over time, as far as these declaratory policy is concerned. But, all, but we have always remained dependent on nuclear weapons, and we will always remain dependent on nuclear weapons unless there is a whole entire transformation in the attitude of all the NATO powers, including the United States, to the business of matching the Soviet army. But how many of those Hence, can be used, if I may, sorry to interrupt, how many of those can be used before you get into the kind of uncontrollable escalation, which brings us to no, no, no. a situation where we have to consider yes. the possibility of nuclear winter? The, the, the facts about the Soviet army mean that we have to rely on nuclear weapons. The other fact has always been that practical men, serious people, have always understood that if you do use more than uh, one or two or a dozen or two dozen, then the jig is up. There are no values worth saving. Hence, there has always been a belief, I, I think, in, in limited nuclear war. But uh, the limited has always been defined at a very much smaller number than the number in inventory. Because the number of nuclear weapons lying around, deployed in different forces, is the number that we have to have on the assumption that the Soviets might try to attack some uh, or to neutralize them or that it would be in the wrong place or the wrong kinds. But are you saying so that yes, a change, new limit sorry, a change of two dozen or yeah. so could take place, and at that stage, politically, the superpowers could say, this is far too dangerous for it to continue, that, that they would then pull back. In other words, the nuclear war could be constrained and restricted at that stage. Yes, except that I personally, it is my personal belief, that uh, even the dozens might be an excessive number because the armies, the institutions, the command, the political structures are really not stressed to withstand the awesome images, the terrifying effects, or merely appearances of, of nuclear weapons. Um, just imagine that you have a very disciplined, solid force, like the British infantry, say, in the First World War, withstanding everything, all manner of artilleries and shellings and 
terrible conditions in, in trenches, uh, knee-high mud or waist-high mud. Then suddenly the Germans use gas, and then you have the finest regiments of the line breaking and running because that gas was the level of stress they couldn't take. And nuclear I believe the nuclear, be weapons nuclear weapons would be, be much, much worse. worse. And therefore, whoever uses them for whatever purpose is going to discover that the institutions, the mechanisms, the battalions, the commands, the parties are going to just unravel. Edward Cook, let me leave it there for a moment and bring in our, our, our three politicians. Robin Cook, first of all, uh, do you think that in particular the, the prospect of this uh, escalation, that Paul Bracken said uh, maybe several hundred weapons, uh, Edward Lutvak was uh, far more cautious, a couple of dozen or so, he said, and the, the jig is up. Uh, the fact that this might lead to nuclear winter, does this alter the way people consider fighting nuclear war? Well, I think if I can just pick up the last phrase you made about fighting nuclear war, I would hope that the mere hypothetical existence of nuclear winter would make it quite clear to every party that you cannot fight a nuclear war with the hope of victory at the end. There can be no victory. Both sides are going to go down in the long term with the ecological disaster that they would create. If I can pick up one or two of the strands that in the previous discussion, it does seem to me that it's much easier to cross any of the subsequent thresholds once you've crossed the first threshold into a nuclear conflict. I argue with some alarm the idea that you could even throw around an odd dozen of nuclear weapons and then confine it there. Because after all, we do know, and Dr. Bracken is quite frank about this, the Soviets intend to throw back, they tend to reply with everything they've got if they are attacked by a single nuclear weapon. They have no idea, no concept, no training, no expectation that they'll be able to confine it at that stage. Moreover, what I never understand of the idea that you can control at that stage is the idea that you then have to have a civilized discussion with the other side having dropped a nuclear weapon on them and say, can we have a truce now? That, that's unrealistic. It's pure fantasy. What worries me is that there do appear to be some people around who believe it. Well, George Orta, I don't know whether you, you believe that or, or not, but there are people certainly who believe that nuclear weapons can be used uh, as a kind of diplomatic message in the early but acute stages of, of a crisis. That is classical escalation theory, isn't it? Uh, do you subscribe to that in any way? Certainly not. No, I think one must start at the beginning in these discussions. And we're talking about films and we're talking about nuclear winters. I don't want a nuclear winter or a nuclear summer or anything else. And I think one must see this whole discussion in, in the context, the rather technical context in which it's taken. I don't believe we should start throwing anything around at any stage. I believe the film is slightly uh, misleading in that sense because I think that any film which is really worth its salt is not going to simply arouse people's fears, uh, quite genuine and understandable fears, but not simply uh, restrict itself to arousing them but he's going to try and deal with the issues, and I don't think either of these films really do that. Well, to the extent that they did or didn't, that is what we're trying to do now, that is what it's designed to do. Well, let me go on. Uh, I think that escalation has a lot to do with the political situation. It is not just a technicality. Therefore, I don't really like this idea of uh, theorizing about how it might be possible to throw around a few here and there. I think if you look back at the film, and we are discussing this film, it all started in Iran, in the Middle East, now, the fact is that a war has been going on in the Gulf for two years, and the Russians and the Americans have been exceedingly cautious about any form of military escalation in the Gulf. In other words, uh, you could argue that deterrence is working, and we are, after all, fundamentally talking about deterrence. Well, let us keep on. Let's keep off uh, deterrence for the moment, because we will come to that uh, in, in a moment. But, John Cartwright, what, what do you believe? Uh, do you think that uh, the strategic that this sort of strategic es this escalation is actually manageable, or is it something which is made more inconceivable by the prospect of nuclear winter? I doubt it's manageable. It seems to me that the most likely way in which you cross the nuclear threshold is by using battlefield nuclear weapons. There is a conventional attack, it can't be held conventionally, and the commanders are therefore tempted to use nuclear artillery, for example. Now, I agree with Robin Cook. Once you cross that threshold, I think you're into a totally unknown area. You simply do not know what is going to happen after that. And uh, if you start using nuclear weapons, it seems to me that the risk is the other side will say, well, we're now into this game. Do we play it in a civilized way, escalating it stage by stage according to the book? Or do we not take that risk? Do we actually go in and hit them with all we've got? And bearing in mind that you're dealing not uh, with people who are sitting down discussing it in a, in a calm, wargaming atmosphere, this is probably after a period of tension. It's people under pressure. And I think once you cross that threshold, you have grave difficulty in holding it down to a, um, a limited nuclear exchange of battlefield systems. Paul Bracken, do you think that it's possible that uh, people will say, 
Clearly, strategic weapons are far too dangerous, but actually tactical weapons may be more usable. And, of course, if tactical weapons are used, that would mean that they were more usable in Europe. Is there a tendency that somebody will think like that? Uh, without supporting or not supporting that position, I think it's likely that some people will come to that conclusion. And then if we think about the scenario we saw last night, it wasn't Central Europe, but it was an American president using nuclear weapons to defend a uh, large conventional force in the Middle East, which was under attack. And it is all well and good to say that once we cross the nuclear threshold, we're in a new world. That's clearly true. And I think the odds of controlling escalation go down substantially to dangerously low remote levels. But the question is, what is the alternative at that point? I don't agree with the position that we should refuse to think about these things. I think some people should think about them, about what to do in the event deterrence fails. It's a very unfortunate problem, but let me play the devil's advocate on this. I think we should agree to think about certain unpleasant problems. Which is uh, a certain exchange of nuclear weapons, because that might stop a crisis from escalating beyond a certain point. That's correct, and it would be a, a better alternative than to an all-out central exchange involving nuclear winters and hundreds of millions of fatalities. Edward Lutvak wants to come in from, from Washington. On this specific point, uh, Dr. Lutvak, uh, that is, is it likely no, to make uh, tactical nuclear war more conceivable? No, no. I, I, was, I wanted to comment on, on the general agreement that uh, seemed to be on your side that the Soviet Union does not, in fact, accept the notion of limited nuclear war and therefore that any attempt to use nuclear weapons, even uh, perhaps uh, one or two weapons, would then trigger this all-out Soviet response. Now, I think that we should be very cautious about accepting um, any Soviet statement on the subject as meaning anything at all. Because, of course, the Soviet Union threatens primarily with the non-nuclear army. We respond by saying, look, if we cannot contain this conventional military threat of your tanks and your men and so on, then we resort to nuclear weapons. And it is their logical propagandistic answer to say, uh, do not try to seek security from uh, nuclear weapons, because if you use any, we will use all of them and destroy the world and so on. Now, what I'm saying is that, that Soviet statements on this subject are not a contribution to our understanding of the situation. They are to be interpreted as part of political warfare. Are you saying that we should not, so, uh, that we should not believe what they say on that subject? On this subject, because the implication is that they would be act in a totally reckless and irrational manner and sort of burn up the world in peak because we have refused the Soviet army to win a clean victory by interfering with them. Can I hear what, um, what, can I hold you there? Can I hear what Robin Cook has to say on that subject, that we should take what the Russians say on that question with a pinch of salt? Oh, I agree, absolutely. You should take what either superpower says, a very large bag of salt. But we do know from the Soviet military posture, from its weapons, from its training, from its military manuals, that they expect to fight all out nuclear war. And in none of these places, none of the manuals, you find the least interest in limited nuclear war. Can I just go back to a point made by Dr. Bracken when he said we've got to think about this and we should start thinking about the unthinkable? What worries me about starting to think about limited nuclear war is that if the notion ever gets about that you can get away with it, and I believe myself it would be a delusion under any circumstances, then that makes it that much easier and much more likely that you're actually going to cross the nuclear threshold. I believe it is much better and much more in the interest of the peoples of the world that both superpowers and both East and West blocs realise from the start that once you cross that threshold, it's going to be very difficult to stop. And since we have a consensus in the studio that it's going to be very difficult to stop once over the threshold, I am tempted to ask why then doesn't NATO agree to a no first use declaration which make it perfectly clear that that threshold is the one that we've got to hold? Let us come on to that later in the programme. Let us agree that a certain consensus has been reached on this particular subject. And let us move on to another question raised in particular by threads. That is the ability or inability of civil defence preparations to be effective in the face of a major nuclear attack. And... Uh, were still perhaps to provide for the survival of the survivors during the nuclear winter and its aftermath. Now, the picture painted by Threads, drawing on existing Home Office documents, publications and training programs, was not a very reassuring one. Uh, to discuss this, we have Dr. Philip Stedman of the Open University and a critic of government civil defence readiness, and Eric Alley, President of the Institute of Civil Defence and Emergency Planning Officer for Humberside, about to join the Home Office as civil defence advisor. And I should say that the point of this issue is not whether civil defence is or is not a good thing to assist during natural disasters or conventional war, but the rather specific one of what it can or cannot do in a large-scale nuclear exchange. Eric Alley, if escalation to an all-out mass nuclear conflict is a pretty likely scenario, what can civil defence 
do in Britain for the victims of such an attack? I don't think that any of the scenarios we've heard, either in the thread yesterday or the film today, invalidates any civil defence preparations whatsoever, ever, because it's no use us sitting down and, and folding our hands and saying there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. We've got to do something, and we've got to ensure that whatever preparations we have, however small, they can do something to, to look after people. And of course, the thing that didn't come across yesterday in threads was the fact that uh, it concentrated on, on, on Sheffield, an unprepared city, a, a city which uh, has not uh, helped its people, helped its population, hasn't given them any advice and guidance, hasn't allowed its officers to go for training. Tell us, all right, tell us then what you would uh, do, what you would like to see, and what would still protect people in a city against the sort of nuclear attack which we are talking about. Now, we're not saying a, a, we, want, we will protect people in a city that's subject to, to a nuclear attack. What we are saying is that with, with adequate civil defence measures, with proper civil defence measures, we, will, we can mitigate the effects of, the, of, of that attack. We can help the survivors to continue to survive. And the thing that didn't come out properly, although the, the implication was there, was the fact that there is something being done. There, there is work to be done for the survivors to help them. To there, would be, there, there, are, there will be certain food supplies available. There will be feeding centers. There will be rest centers outside the uh, attacked area. Even, even to survive nuclear winter? E even, yes, even, even to survive nuclear winter. It would mean that our preparations, as we have them today, with the establishment of our community advisor training program, with getting the communities working in groups, they could then, uh, the survivors could survive the nuclear winter. Can I bring in Philip Stedman here? Uh, does any of that uh, convince you? If you had Eric Alley looking after things in, in your area, would you think that uh, something was doable for the survivors? Yes, I think it's very difficult to say that nothing can be done, and certainly it would be quite immoral to say nothing should be done. I think what's wrong in the uh, government's our British civil defence programme as it has been and as it uh, looks as though it's going to be in the future is that it, uh, it isn't honest with people, that it tries to deceive people into thinking that the effects are not as bad, not going to be as bad as we saw on the Threads film. Um, it tries to underestimate, it, its, its calculations of the numbers of likely casualties have consistently been underestimates. Um, that's, I think, the dishonesty. I think even in the worst case kind of scenarios, in the sort of attack that we saw portrayed in threads, which is by no means a worst case, uh, our, the calculations that our group have made show that there would be perhaps 10 million short-term survivors. I'm, can I just interrupt you there? I mean, there are two things. One, why should it matter that the Home Office says what its figures about calculations are? And surely the issue of civil defence is not whether you can guess the number who are going to be dead, but what you can do for those who are alive. Now, in not with that context, do you think that a government civil defence programme can do anything for people who survive, especially in the context of nuclear winter? Well, it depends what you mean by doing something. Um, Helping them to live better than they lived in threats. <laughs> You can reduce the number of short-term casualties. There are ways in which you could do that. You could protect people from the effects of fallout. You could, have, you could build shelters. There are other measures you could take. The problem with uh, what now appears with the, the, the nuclear winter findings is that you are merely postponing the agony. You are, as it were, uh, sheltering people only to face the consequences of what they then come out to. So you, so you think Eric Alley and his like cannot really uh, help people to survive in any significant way under the impact of a nuclear winter of several years? They can ease the pain. They can, look out, they can help people to die more easily. or They can try to do something for small numbers of people who would be in peripheral areas, perhaps, say, in the Scottish Highlands or in the north of Wales. Eric Alley, is, is that all you can do to ease the pain towards uh, an inevitable death? No, what we're heading for now, again, is this tunnel vision, this apocalyptic mode that we seem to get into all the time, that everybody is going to die. Yes, the, uh, one can ease the pain for those who may well be dying, but there are the stronger who will carry on and survive. And I'd like to take issue here with, with Philip on the question that we've always uh, 
underestimated the effects. We've never underestimated the effects of, of nuclear war. I've been doing this job now for over 30 years, and I, I've lived with, the, with, with it for, for that length of time. We know what the effects are. We've always faced up to the effects, and we, we've dealt with the figures as we saw them. Can I but just, they're constantly yeah. being revised and updated all the time. Can I just one thing clear from Philip Stedman? You are saying that these figures, which may or may not be for internal home office consumption, should be made public to, to the public. Is that right? I'm not just talking about figures. I disagree with Eric Alley when he says that uh, they, they, they've never made underestimates. The, the government the home office have made very, very serious under, in, underestimates. And they've been heavily criticized for doing so by ourselves, by the British Medical Association other people and in the face of that criticism they have actually withdrawn their figures at the moment we have a kind of limbo in which the home office will not actually produce any calculations they say that they're revising them uh, but they've been obliged to withdraw their previous figures but it's not just the calculations of how many people might be killed or injured it's the whole posture of trying to avoid discussion trying to uh, I mean the very title of protect and survive clearly intended to carry a kind of comforting impression, isn't it? Okay, can you hold it there for a moment, and let's hear what, what the politicians... George, George Walden, I'm the accusation that, first of all, the government Home Office is not honest about calculations, and that they, it avoids discussion of the issues, both of those who will survive uh, and of those who are going to be killed. Could I just say that what we have been reminded uh, by these two films is that the effects of nuclear war are incalculable. And, of course, even without the benefit of scientists, that a lot of people suspected that before, and you and I, I imagine, were amongst them. And so if they're incalculable, it's rather difficult to know exactly what the effects might be on humans, but we expect them to be rather fearsome. So therefore, it seems to me entirely rational to do something about it. Could I draw attention to one aspect of this, which I think is very important and hasn't been mentioned so far, and that is that if the theory of the nuclear winter is remotely correct, it does make finally complete and utter nonsense of the nuclear free zone idea. It won't be any good hanging a, hanging a notice on your door saying, uh, I'm out of this, you know, plague on all of you, because the plague will hit you whether you like it or not. And that, I would have thought, is another argument. It reinforces the argument for doing something, however much a contingency, on civil defense. Just specifically, what can be done after all we've been, had this picture painted in, in threads of uh, uh, crops failing for months, e even years. What do you think that civil defense can do, and what is the government doing which can ease that particular prospect? Well, is anything being done? Well, we know that it is being done. It's being done and taken seriously by this government. But I think it's a great mistake to present this as the central issue, or even one of the central issues. The central issue is to stop, prevent the war by defense and, and by deterrence. Taking out an insurance does not mean that you're preparing for an accident. I know we shall, we shall come on, on, on to the terrace, but this is an important issue in itself. Robin Cook, what do you feel about well, what I, Eric Alley said about yes, civil defence? I would like to take up the point that Eric Alley made about Sheffield being an unprotected city, and this came over in the film. In fact, in yesterday's film, what came across very strongly was the families that did try very faithfully and honestly to carry out the government's advice and protect and survive to protect themselves, discovered the utter futility of that advice because they were in a city hit by two attacks, one bang on the city, and in those circumstances, the house in which they built their inner refuge was reduced to rubble. So many of those who hid under the cellars were trapped under the cellars. Those that did survive the initial blast and the initial fire then found that they were open to the elements and open to radiation. Now, there is no conceivable way in which they could prepare in advance for those eventualities, and it is dishonest to pretend that there is any sensible way in which the people of Sheffield can now protect themselves against an attack on Sheffield, other than getting out of Sheffield. And here well, I even that with the nuclear winter is not much of well, an option, is it? You, you, can get out, you can get out of Sheffield in advance of the attack, except that an important part of the civil defence preparations which came across in the film is that the government will send troops and police in to prevent them getting out of the city before the attack. The fact of the matter is the civil defence programme is deeply dishonest. It's dishonest to the public. It's dishonest also in pretending it's about the public because most expenditure goes in protecting the government, the local government service, the police and the army. It's Hold not on. to do with the public. Hold on. And no, no, no doubt you might say people, people, people like Eric Alley, if you're being very unfair, but there's a charge. Well, that wouldn't that, wish that, to be uh, personal. Well, he's far too nice, I suppose. But, but there's a charge. The money is not really being spent and cannot be spent 
on protecting people. Would you like to answer that, Eric Ellie? Well, yes. I, first of all, let me say this. I, I don't know which film Robin Cook saw last night, but he, he certainly didn't see the same one that I saw. Because, first of all, there wasn't a direct attack on Chef, but if there was, there would have been a smoking crate around that uh, control centre. Secondly, the people who, who did their very rough protection, uh, they did, one of them survived anyway, and, and went off out, and you saw him eventually by the food stores. The, the Is other that dying of radiation sickness? No, he wasn't dying of radiation. He was very, he was very active, in fact, around the food store. And the he other was, people he was went, dead halfway through the film. No, and the other people who went down in the cellar, the only way they died was because a couple of looters went and smashed their heads in, but they survived in the cellar. So They were still the, dead at the end of the film. But they were dead not because of, of nuclear radiation or nuclear winter or anything else. They were dead because some looters got in and smashed their heads in, and that's the reason why they wanted protecting. And the other point is that the people who were trying to, uh, who were moving out of the city weren't stopped from going out of the city. The city wasn't ringed with troops and police to stop them going out at all. They were advised not to leave the home because that was the best place to stay. Let's, let, let's move on to the back to the broader principles. John Cartwright, how much point is there in the light of what we've seen for a civil defence programme and is anything that Britain has at the moment likely to be of any effect in the sort of scenarios we've seen in these two films? I doubt it. I, my concern about the government's attitude to civil defence is that it seems to be neither one thing nor the other. It seems to me you could make a very clear argument that in uh, an island as crowded and small as Britain, faced with the possibility of a major nuclear attack, there's nothing sensible you could do about civil defence. That's one argument. Or you could say, we may not have a, a dramatic effect on it, but we could actually reduce the impact on a lot of people, and you'd go in for a major shelter program, and all the rest of it, as some other countries have done. Now, this government's neither doing one nor the other. It's giving the semblance of having something, some form of civil defense, resting very often on local authorities who don't agree with it and aren't carrying it out. And there's nothing really solid and dependable there behind the facade. And that, I think, really is a, the worst of all possible worlds. Are you arguing for a full-scale shelter programme? I am not. No, indeed. What I'm say, I, saying is that uh, I don't believe that there is a sensible civil defence role against a, uh, an all-out nuclear attack. But why do we assume it will be an all-out nuclear attack, uh, a conventional attack? could uh, cause a great deal of havoc, as we've seen in, uh, in Beirut in, in recent years. I wouldn't have thought there was much disagreement about civil defence in that role, but, but, but the question but if, is, does sure. it have an effect in the... But if we don't have change? the machinery, and we don't have the machinery very largely now, it will not be there to deal with a conventional attack or something of that sort. That's George, the problem. George Walden, what, what about this discharge, though, that really it cannot do anything, uh, and the government is not doing anything, because it's neither one policy nor another, as John Cartwright has just said? I think the government must do what it can in this respect. It must do it in a way that doesn't alarm people too much. It must do it in a way that doesn't give any impression that we are, in fact, thinking in terms of preparing for a nuclear war, which would be, of course, rubbish. We're not. Uh, but we must take account of what the Russians are doing in this respect, which is quite considerable. And we must be realistic about the aims that we can devote to it. But above all, let us remember that uh, the effects of a nuclear war are incalculable, and therefore it must never start. Paul Bracken, could, under certain circumstances, a proper civil defence programme that's brought into the United States be seen as being destabilising in a situation of East-West crisis? We have exactly the same debates as we're experiencing here in the United States, and exactly the same charges are made. And there is some grounds to it. I mean, if uh, in a tense crisis our satellites detected that the Soviets were evacuating their major cities, that would be extraordinarily destabilizing and would be an example of civil defense actually tipping you into the crisis and war that you don't want. Is that an argument for it or against it? Uh, I wish I could say. It's a hard question. I don't think I can offer salvation to one path or the other. I'm just trying to point out the implications of one's actions. Can I uh, call in uh, Dr. Lutbach here? Because I believe you have views on the Soviet uh, view of uh, civil defense, which George Walden just, just uh, referred to. How seriously well, do they George take it? Wal George Walden is uh, an expert on the Soviet Union, but um, one of the interesting things about the Soviet attitude to civil defense is that at home, of course, they have a very large program, a very elaborate organization, a whole hierarchy of civil defense generals. They spend a great deal of money. They build a lot of shelters. They do a lot of evacuation. They have lots of stores and so on. At the same time, in their statements addressed to the West, notably England, they say, oh, it is quite foolish and futile to make any preparation against nuclear war. If you use any nuclear weapons, there will be the all-out nuclear war, and everybody will die, etc. I think that in your country, as in ours, we should follow the example of the powers that are serious about conflict. 
and that calculate that perhaps the conflict will be so enormous that any effort will be wasted. But it's just as likely that there'll be lesser threats, lesser conflicts, perhaps conventional, perhaps very limited. Uh, and these justify a more serious civil defense program than we have had, and perhaps than you've had. Dr. Leclerc, thank you very much for, for that. And let's uh, leave the civil defense uh, argument there for a time, because I think we should move on to the final section, which is the idea of the impact of the nuclear winter hypothesis on theories of uh, nuclear deterrence. Now, is it undermined or is it reinforced? If a nuclear first strike can engulf the attacker himself in a nuclear winter, is this not a powerful reinforcement to deterrence because it would appear to make a preemptive strike inconceivable? Or does the nuclear winter increase the urgency of new thinking on the whole nuclear defense question? Well, let's take that argument on with Dr. Gwyn Prince, fellow of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and editor of the new study, The Choice, Nuclear Weapons Versus Security, which features the views of senior military critics of present nuclear strategies, and General Sir Anthony Farrah Hockley, former Commander-in-Chief of North Atlantic Forces. General, first of all, are you changed in any of your views about nuclear deterrence by the nuclear winter hypothesis? No, I should have thought that what we've seen in both films strengthens the view that the possession of nuclear weapons is a deterrent to war in, in a broad sense. Of course, I think we're uh, occasionally in danger in this discussion in straying into the notion that uh, all this is uh, a new discovery. We know, do we not, that since the 1950s, when the balance of terror began to emerge in as much as Stalin's forces and his successors uh, had got nuclear weapons as well as those in the West, uh, that uh, terror could be inflicted by one side on the other and expect to be returned. Uh, we simply have some new studies which show that perhaps it's even more awful than we thought. So it doesn't actually change any of the calculations? No, but this, uh, the reason I mention this question of it not being entirely new hat but partly old hat is that we do need to see this in perspective. Uh, as Dr. Lutbeck has said, uh, the idea that's pervaded by many people that the moment we go to war there's going to be a nuclear holocaust is to my mind balmy. Um, it wouldn't suit us. It wouldn't suit the Soviet Union. They may be a bunch of ruthless opportunists uh, in the Kremlin, but they are not a member of the Kamikaze Club. Uh, they've got nothing to gain by going in for such uh, an action immediately. And we are much more likely to have that period of conventional uh, attack and uh, attempt to hold on the part of the West than uh, going in in an early stage for nuclear attacks. We are, I must say, also, because it's uh, a skeleton at the feast here, we are much more likely to have chemical attack upon us, which we continually ignore, and perhaps one day we can discuss this in a serious and similar way. Uh, but we could come, of course, in spite of all that deterrence, to the point where Sakya's conventional forces are so weakened that they are going to break, being inferior in numbers, and he has to turn to the heads of government and say, within 24 hours, I have to tell you, my forces will be defeated at one point or another, which will lead to a major defeat. Now, the only way I can in any way hold and perhaps gather together some conventional reserves is to drop a tactical nuclear. And you're saying that that request and the calculations which flow from it would not be affected and will not be affected by the knowledge that nuclear winter may be the result of the process that is started there? Well, I don't know. I mean, the people who are going to give the answer to that question, you see, are the heads of government. They're going to say, yes, we think we must risk this, or no, we don't. If they don't, in spite of all the propaganda that's put about, uh, mainly from the Soviet Union, um, there won't be a nuclear, tactical nuclear weapon launched. Gwyn Prince, what, what do you feel about that? Does nuclear winter change anything about deterrence, as uh, and, uh, General Farrah Hockley thinks it doesn't? I'm a little surprised by the General's response, because I think that one of the things that is made abundantly plain by the evidence is that insofar as nuclear weapons have a role in making cautious, already cautious superpowers, it is in making a threat which as we saw in the program, can be made with nuclear weapons possessed in what's often called the minimum deterrent capability at far, far lower levels of both numbers of warheads and of megatons than we possess. Bear in mind that 
It was suggested for us at one stage that the nuclear winter, with all that that implies, can be brought on by levels perhaps as low as some small hundreds of megatons. And we now sit in a world which we share with some 18,000 megatons in whatever it is, 54,000 warheads. Now, if this is so, then I think some very important and interesting questions must be raised. One of them, and this does take issue with a point of view that's been expressed by a number of our colleagues earlier in the program, is the suggestion that far from anyone's mind is the idea of employing nuclear weapons in some putatively military role. It is plainly the case, and a clear part of the history of nuclear weapons, that one of the ways in which both of the superpowers have tried to square the circle of making an inherently incredible threat credible is to try and develop doctrines and weapons that appear to be usable. We are now, as I think the public is well aware, standing on the brink of important new developments, especially in Western strategy. We see the potential arrival of doctrines which involve the integrated use of nuclear, chemical, as the general has mentioned, and other conventional forms of weapon uh, in the context of the European theater, at the same time that we see the arrival of new and unverifiable and undetectable strategic weapons, right. like the sea launch cruise missile. And can I just, just row you back then, get back mm. to the central point. Is deterrence more or less credible as a result of the nuclear winter? I think it becomes less credible. And the reason that I think that it becomes less credible is that we must make a plain distinction between nuclear deterrence and deterrence. It's something which often gets left out in the debate. You see, it seems to me that one of the things that has smuggled itself in as an assumption into our debate so far is the thought that the Soviet Union stands ready at every instant to plunge upon us and to take advantage of our weakness. Now, it's hard to see what the historical evidence is for that. But even if we assume it to be so, we're then making two further assumptions. One, that they having that intention, there is no other threat that we can make of a lesser order that would deter them. Perhaps it's best to dwell upon this for a moment. Because well, uh, yes, can I know, can, can you, because I think it's, it's still this central question. I, I want to hear what the politicians say, because they are for the people who deal in, in deterrence, or their governments deal in deterrence. Does it make any difference to your belief? I think you already indicated, George Walton, but repeat it in the context. You think that deterrent theory, nuclear deterrent theory, as Winfred rightly says, is that altered by the prospect of nuclear winter? I will listen very carefully to what the experts have to say, and I'm not against abstract thinking in this field, but my own reaction is that it will probably reinforce a deterrence which is already working. And I'd like to go back there and say again what I said earlier. I think the premise of the film was false. The premise that a war would start in Iran, I think it's false and demonstrably false by recent experience. A war has been raging in the Gulf, and there's no risk of a superpower conflict at the moment. Deterrence is working, and if this is a new discovery in the Soviet Union, as it appears to be in the United States, that will reinforce a deterrence which is already working. John Cartwright? I think probably deterrence is strengthened because uh, the whole concept of, uh, uh, of the nuclear winter makes what we already regarded as being appalling weapons even more appalling, and in that sense I think uh, the deterrence is, uh, is strengthened. I think one thing that does come out of it, though, is to uh, uh, to invalidate the argument that if Britain, for example, unilaterally gave up nuclear weapons and took itself out of the nuclear uh, field by removing all nuclear bases, that would somehow make us safer. I think uh, the message of the nuclear winter is that nobody is going to be safer as a result of this. And in that sense, it makes our need to get superpower uh, negotiations to reduce the nuclear arsenals even stronger. Robin Cook, uh, George Walter thinks deterrence is just the same. John Cartwright thinks it is actually strengthened by the nuclear winter. What do you think? Well, can I first of all say that deterrence is changing all the time. It has changed enormously over the last 20 years. You have posed the question as if there is a stable level of deterrence which has existed during that period. But as the point has been made by Gwyn Prince, during that period, we both sides have added enormously to their arsenals. Moreover, it's not simply a change in numbers. It's a change in the nature of the weapons. The weapons that are now being acquired are super accurate weapons designed and devised to strike the weapons on the other side before they're used. Trident is a first strike weapon. That is what it was designed for as the by the Americans. And that is what we're now acquiring from the Americans. Now, that type of weaponry in any period of international tension is going to greatly increase tension because both sides are going to be very nervous indeed about being caught on the ground by a first strike by the other side. Uh, 
So that constantly over the past 20, 30 years, we have seen deterrence changed by the growing numbers of the arsenal and also by the nature of the weapons there. And far from increasing deterrence and stability, that has made it much more likely that we may end up with the very war that these weapons claim to deter. And what, of course, comes out of nuclear winter is if we do topple over that threshold, if we do end up in a nuclear war, then the consequences are far more incalculable and possibly far worse than we ever imagined before, possibly even extinction of the human race. General Farrah Hockley, in, in, in view of the danger, awful, nobody pretends that deterrence is entirely safe. There is a risk attached to that policy, to, to every policy. But now that we know that the consequences of failure of a policy of nuclear deterrence are so vast, should that not alter how we think about it? They've been vast for a very long time, and it's not a question, as Dr. Prince asserts, that we expect the Russians to, uh, to break in upon us. The contention is that they are not thinking of breaking in upon us because they are uncertain about the dreadful consequences which might flow from it. Uh, we are not, at the present moment, giving anything away as to how or when or whether we should use nuclear weapons, but they are there as a sanction. That is the deterrence. And uh, for the time being, it is working. Of course, we should all be working towards getting rid of these nuclear weapons. But they are here. They won't go away, as everybody knows, with a wave of the magic wand. And at the present time, the balance of terror is holding. And as we now know, it is likely to be an even worse balance of terror. Dr. Lutwak in Washington, what do you think about the effect on deterrence? Well, well first of all, since we just heard the peroration from the gentleman of the Labour Party, Robin which Cook. echoes this familiar line that there are more and more nuclear weapons and they're more and more dangerous. I think looking back on it, it is quite clear that the peace has been maintained by what we call deterrence. And the deterrence has been maintained by the very process of successively introducing new weapons to maintain, so to speak, a steady state of discouragement. Not, of course, of the Soviet Union leaping upon us, but of the Soviet Union threatening us from its position of conventional superiority. The arms race has been a substitute for war, not its maker. Now, on the nuclear winter, let's keep our numbers straight here. Um, the current calculations say several hundred megatons bring about what is called the nuclear winter. Now, several hundred megatons, of course, is a huge quantity. It is, of course, a quantity that could not be expended even by the most reckless use of tactical, the battlefield nuclear weapons that General Farrah Hockley was talking about, the sort of, of authorization request that the Supreme Allied Commander might make would not concern hundreds of megatons. It would concern a fraction of, the, of that amount. Moreover, with reference to the nuclear winter, these weapons have indeed become more accurate, and they've also become smaller and smaller in megaton yields. The United States now has perhaps one quarter of the megatonage it had at the peak 20 years ago. As we move into new weapons that are more accurate, the, their warhead sizes are also declining. Now, I'm not saying that, that you're going to get down to nuclear weapons so small that they're just more efficient conventionals. They will still be, but the danger of the catastrophic climatic and environmental consequences from the launch of a relatively small number of weapons which would have been a very real danger 20 years ago, is no longer with us as of now. Hold it there, uh, Dr. Lutwak. Uh, yes, sorry, uh, Gwyn Prince is uh, eager to, to comment on that. Yes, Mr. Tewson, I'd like to come back to a point that's now been raised by, by three of our contributors, which is the observation that deterrence, meaning nuclear deterrence, has worked and continues to work, because this is an observation that I think bears a little close examination. Now, I think that one of the things that the world of nuclear deterrence has brought us, that is one of its greatest disservices in the last 40 years, has been a sort of tunnel vision. What's happened is that a perfectly reasonable and respectable military concept of deterrence has been lifted up and elevated into the sphere of the analysis of international affairs and has led, as George Kennan has observed in the States, to the militarization of the way in which we look at international relations. And the consequence of this is that we view the relationships between the superpowers almost exclusively in these terms, and we place a hand, a dark hand, which covers whole areas of the human experience. Now, as Mr. Walden and Sir Anthony and Mr. Lutvak well know, neither they can prove that nuclear weapons in some conclusive way have preserved this quasi-peace of the 40 years, nor 
can I disprove it on direct evidence? What, what do you think has preserved if it's not nuclear weapons? What I think we should do in order to find the answer to this is to look at precisely those areas which have been covered over by this preoccupation. Now, we have to look at intentions, and intentions are things which is exceedingly difficult to analyze if we are simply going to use the proper but now promiscuously and improperly used military concept of a worst-case assumption. Okay, again, can I stop you there? You're saying stop counting Soviet uh, weapons, Soviet tanks, Soviet rockets, quite so insistently, and look at what they're trying to do politically. In a, in a, in a word, is that without a gross oversimplification of a subtle thesis? Yeah. Right, George Alden, can I hear your, your comment on that? Well, I think it's a very important point, and I'm glad Dr. Prince has raised it, because one thing that's worried me about this discussion, and, and many discussions like it, is the overemphasis on technology of war, a uh, technocratic approach, if you like, and underemphasis on the politics of avoiding a war uh, occurring at all. It was, I think, Anaring Bevan when he reluctantly agreed to a British deterrent who observed that weapons don't make war, politics too do. That is now a cliche, but it was a, a wise thought uh, at that time. And I think what we need to stop anything like what we saw in that film occurring are three things. One is defense, obviously. Secondly, you need arms control, which you can't have without defense because the Russians won't talk to you unless you're armed. And thirdly, and this in a way is the most important thing, you need a civilized political relationship with the Soviet Union. And if I'm to be critical about the United States, I would say that I'm a little surprised that it's taken President Reagan three and a half years to get round to shaking Mr. Gromyko's hand. It might well be there isn't a great deal of disagreement in, in, in the studio on, on, on that, but uh, General Farah, Farah Hockley. Yes, uh, Paul Bracken, there is. If we look at the past uh, post-war crises, uh, the Suez in 1956, the invasion of the Middle East in 1973, when the United States and the Soviet Union came to disagreements, uh, there were times, at least in, especially in the 73 case, when detente was at its height. I don't think that good day-to-day -day political relationships uh, necessarily solve all of our problems, as the 1973 case illustrates. We had very good relations at that time, but it did not stop the Soviet Union from aiding uh, its allies. It was a useful condition, but, but, but not, as they say, a, 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 a sufficient one. Exactly. Robin Cook. I don't think that we're in a position to choose between good international relations or trying to control the technology of the arms race, you've got to do both of them. And it's quite clear in retrospect that one of the things that undermined detente was the sheer mass of the arsenals and the pace of the arms race by which they were increasing. But you can't actually hope to have a good constructive dialogue with the other side when you patently are enhancing <coughs> your ability to wipe them off the face of the globe. In that case, are there measures of arms control which yes. uh, we, can, we can take? We should suggest a couple. Well, I think that you've got to view arms control as a process. Now, if I was viewing it as a process, my first step would be to freeze the present development of nuclear weapons. I think the freeze demand in the United States makes a lot of sense. General Farrar Hockley did say that we should be working to get rid of the nuclear weapons. As a matter of fact, at the present time on both sides, and including Britain, there is a movement in all three places to greatly increase the number of warheads. Now, that is daft, given what we've just seen about the danger that these weapons hold. Secondly, I would go on the Western side for an agreement on no first use of nuclear weapons, which we could get to the Soviet Union, and which would emphasize the importance of the nuclear threshold as the point at which you hold any confrontation in Central Europe. And then beyond that, you could then get into the business of negotiating actual reductions in the number of warheads. I have to say that, of course, what Britain does, and this is critical, because we are at the moment proposing to acquire a Trident submarine system, which will mean that our own number of warheads will increase by either eightfold or fourteenfold. We don't know quite which because it's a secret classified information. But that kind of escalation will, of course, be replicated on the other side and will make it infinitely much more difficult to get away from the vast extent of overkill, which we saw graphically in the previous film, and which ever detonated could mean, as we now know, incalculable consequences for our time. Okay, George Walden has made three suggestions for how we can improve the political climate. You've made three suggestions for how we can do something about um, actual arms control, which is one of his categories. John Cartwright, would you like to suggest uh, various measures, or do you agree with what's been said? I agree with, with some of the things that have been said. I'm strongly in favour of getting towards a no-first-use situation, provided we recognise that in order to achieve that, we have to strengthen our conventional defences. We have to have a credible uh, conventional defence to enable us to uh, uh, reduce our dependence on uh, nuclear weapons. I think that's the, the first essential, and it is not a cheap option, and we have to face that fact. When it comes to arms control, uh, it does seem to me that uh, further developments of the ideas of build-down, for example, so that every time you modernise a system, and we cannot stop easily the uh, pressure for modernising and, and bringing in new technology into the nuclear weapons field, every time there is a modernisation, you reduce the numbers. 
that's the essential, in my view, on both sides to get those nuclear arsenals down. General Farrah Hockley, what about the proposal that Robin Cook made, saying that one of the categories that we ought to be looking at is a no-first-use declaration? Why should we make uh, a declaration if we are going to have these weapons as to how we are going to use them? Uh, to my mind, that weakens, doesn't, it does not uh, increase the prospect of deterrence. And why should we put the slightest faith on a statement by the Soviet Union in peace that it will not use, uh, be the first to use nuclear weapons? It has no need to, as a matter of fact, because its conventional forces, which are patently developed for attack, uh, are quite able to roll over our conventional forces in any prolonged war, both in the numbers they've got and in the depth of their resources behind them. Prince, Prince can, you, can you answer that question? Why should we make this declaration? If deterrence is going to work, it has to depend upon three conditions. They have to hold simultaneously and all the time. The first one is that you have to have a rational opponent who understands the threat that you're making. And the second thing is that you have to have an accurate enough understanding of what your opponent thinks that you can make a threat that is credible. Now, what I am particularly worried about in the way in which General Farrar Hockley has presented this is that whilst I concede that Western strategy indeed pivots on his observation that we must create doubt, I believe that the political consequence of what may or may not be a desirable military con condition is that it will militate against the second of those conditions. The third condition is one that has already been dealt with by Dr. Bracken earlier. It is that being rational, which is in itself, knowing human nature, an unreasonable assumption to hold all the time, being rational, having understood and been deterred by the threat, that your opponent is then going to be sufficiently in control of his own forces, that he may ensure that they do not do something that you will misunderstand. Now, the problems that arise when we interlace nuclear weapons with this are legion, and the reason is straightforward. I believe that there is a consensus here in the studio that military forces should be designed to produce political signals that are clearly understood. And the central problem, which I tried to emphasize earlier about nuclear weapons, is that they make lousy political signals. Therefore, military reform within NATO, which I believe to be urgently necessary. Towards no first use? Towards no first use as a first step, as the so-called Gang of Four have argued in the United That's States. That's the American Gang of Four, the not the British one. American Gang of Four, not the British one, is indeed an important first step. But accompanying that, may I throw in a measure which we could have, if indeed President Reagan and Mr. Gromyko cared to discuss it within 30 days, it has been said, and that is we must have a comprehensive test ban. That is the yes. quickest and most efficient way of stopping the development of these new and extremely provocative weapon systems. So a certain amount of nodding of heads Thank among you. the politicians. Paul Bracken, as, a, as an American, no first use and uh, an immediate uh, freeze? Well, uh, just let me point out that NATO is moving to a de facto no first use of nuclear battlefield nuclear weapons by its removal of those weapons from the theater. And they're doing that. They made that decision collectively and unilaterally. The idea that you're giving up something for nothing is just not true. We've had weapons there which are, you can't pen out alert safely. You can't control them once they're sent into battle, and they do more harm than good. Not in my judgment, in the judgment of the NATO governments, which is why they voted to get, get them out of there. Uh, on the freeze question, I think that's just much more complicated and things has a lot of political constraints, and there's not much I can add. Sorry, uh, but uh, it was the, the test ban treaty. I'm sorry, that was the point Gwyn uh, Prince made. But if I may pick yeah, up the yeah. point that Paul has made, in that case, if that is so, why is it that we have programs which are marching ahead in the United States now to create new generations of nuclear artillery right. shells? We, we don't. All of those programs have been underfunded, much to the d dismay of the U.S. Army. And the interesting thing about the recent NATO decision, it has not been compensated for by any increase in the research and development money for American battlefield nuclear weapons. We are getting them out of there slowly but surely, and we're doing it because we don't want to announce a no first use doctrine. We found the troubles of raising changes in NATO doctrine in the 1960s when we moved to flexible response. This time the policy is to do it first and not talk very much about it. Uh, let us uh, end with, with uh, the, the politicians. We have a particular east-west uh, situation. Mr. Reagan, Mr. Gromyko will be meeting uh, this, this week. Do you sense uh, in your more optimistic moods that we are about to see a change in the sort of tension there's been between the superpowers and maybe the start of the kind of dialogue which could begin to reduce nuclear stockpiles? George Walton? I think we're beginning to get the sort of political climate that is essential if arms control is going to work. Dr. Kissinger often points out, quite rightly, that you mustn't overload arms control in East-West relations. If it's going to work, it's got to be wrapped up. You've got to put political flesh on the bones. At the moment, there are too many nuclear bones, not enough political flesh. John Cartwright? 
I uh, would certainly hope that we're seeing progress. I think uh, I'm slightly surprised there is any movement ahead of the uh, presidential election. I think most of us had accepted that nothing very dramatic would uh, happen ahead of the election. It may well be that the Soviets have calculated that President Reagan is going to be re-elected, so they better start talking to him now. Anyway, if, if it's moving in the right direction, I think that's a hopeful sign. Robin Cook, do you feel inclined to any kind of uh, optimism that the superpower tension that we've seen in the last two to three years is well, going to start unwinding? I am very encouraged that at last President Reagan is going to speak to a senior Soviet uh, member of the Soviet government. And perhaps what we need as well as a freeze of his nuclear weapon program is a thaw in his relations with the Soviet Union. But I'm bound to reserve judgment until that meeting's taken place and we see what comes of it, because unfortunately President Reagan has a consistent uh, and unrivaled record of opposing every single arms control agreement that's ever been struck, even the non-proliferation treaty. And I don't myself think that we can rely on that meeting producing results. I do think the time has come when the countries of Europe, including Britain, have to take an initiative and a lead to break the log jams built up in the superpower relationship. And can I just finally say that there's been much stress placed in the previous discussion about the fact that we've had 38 years of peace in Europe. 38 years is a very small interval in the history of mankind. And if we project forward the kind of build-up that we saw in the last film, the nuclear arms, the nuclear weapons, and the increasing sophistication of them, it must be very doubtful if we can go on indefinitely with that kind of very finely balanced of terror without something upsetting it. George Walton, would you disagree with that? Some of the implications, yes, but the overall ten tonality, no. Well, this debate has only just begun. It is, of course, a twin-track debate, first involving the critical examination and testing of the nuclear winter hypothesis, second, applying that hypothesis to the strategic concepts uh, we've relied on for the last 20 to 30 years. I hope that in the last hour we have at least introduced some of the urgent questions that will form part of this re-examination, and to our participants, both academic and political, Thank you and good night from this Newsnight nuclear debate.